Canada is a world leader in maternal health, but studies suggest that infants and parents of racialized and indigenous families don't always experience the kinds of health outcomes that one might expect from such a highly praised system. Joining us now on The Health Gap, Dr. Onye Norom, a family doctor, a lecturer in public health at the University of Toronto, and the president of the Black Physicians Association of Ontario. Sarah Wolf, founding partner of Seventh Generation Midwives Toronto, and Elsie Amoako, a graduate student of U of T's Dalalana School of Public Health, founder of maternal health startup, Mummy Monitor. Welcome to you all. It's nice yeah. to have you here. Thank you. Um, so from the work you've done, is the perinatal health care experience different for Indigenous and racialized mums and infants? Anya, I'll start with you. Yes, yeah, so um, it is different, to, to, um, to be brief. So what we've noticed, and particularly within the Black Physicians Association, so I won't just speak for myself, but for obstetrician and gynecologists as well, mm -hmm. there are three areas where they've noticed that it's different for racialized women. So one is uh, being able to access culturally safe care. Mm -hmm. And so by that, I mean uh, care where somebody understands your culture or understands the, dif the differences that you might have and doesn't judge you or discriminate against you based on that. So to give an example, uh, patients will travel very far distances to seek care from a provider who is either racialized or from the same culture. Uh, so at Taibu Community Health Center, where I practice, patients come from very far away because there's a mandate to serve the black community. Mm -hmm. They don't feel safe or that they would be respected in other healthcare settings. Mm -hmm. Another issue um, that's often faced is that, well, we know that uh, racialized communities are more likely to live in poverty. So uh, racialized Canadians are three times more likely to be living in poverty. And we know it's similar for Indigenous populations as well to be living in poverty. And so uh, sometimes there can be misunderstandings because you might have a mom who's working uh, in conditions where she doesn't have sick days, where she doesn't have uh, an employer or a boss who understands that she has to go for you know, a number of different clinical visits. And so some of these patients might miss visits or might not be able to afford for their medications or might not be able to just eat in a really healthy way that would benefit their child. And so sometimes healthcare providers might misunderstand that mm -hmm. and that also can create a rift. So those two things in particular uh, play, play a part in patients uh, not being able three. to sit. Yes, and so the third uh, is really that these are populations that experience racism. And so a lot of the, um, the patients that are seen who are racialized or indigenous also might just have um, one could say uh, um, a fear of entering certain institutions because they've had previous experiences, you know, in the educational system, uh, the criminal justice system, in the labor market where they've been discriminated against. So it's a little bit similar to the cultural piece, mm -hmm. but where we're talking about uh, indigenous people or racialized people who are born here, they still end up uh, either having worse outcomes or being experiencing greater stress trying to kind of manage and navigate in that situation. The last piece that you mentioned, the fear, I don't think that's something that a lot of us would even think about. Um, Sarah, what have you noticed in your work? Yeah, I mean, I certainly would echo all of your comments. That's uh, things that we've seen in the Indigenous community that we're serving at Seventh Generation Midwives of Toronto as well, is this idea that access to care is differential across the board, that poverty has major impact, and that providers don't understand the subtle ways that poverty um, really impacts and so while you know providers as a as a profession tend to understand and to know that poverty is one of the social determinants of health and how it does have impacts it's recognizing the little nuances of how that impacts that individual person's life that is really quite a, a big challenge mm -hmm. and um, and then of course the disparities of health outcomes goes across the board when you have people who are living in poverty and living in um, situations where there are lots of stressors and uh, differential access that has health impacts across the board and so what we see are uh, big gaps across all of the different outcome measures that we look at in maternal child health and even in population health mm -hmm. and of course that you know doubly impacts what their experience is going to be and finally Elsie 
I think that even more so, I think specifically, though, although we do have very limited data specifically around the black population, so that includes the African, Caribbean, and black um, di diaspora community, I think that data has showed us consistently that we're already three to four times more likely to experience a life-threatening complication, right? We also, there are various studies in Canada, specifically looking at Ontario and Quebec, that identified that black women or African and Caribbean women were experiencing preterm outcomes that were much more um, adverse in comparison to their white counterparts. We're seeing this consistently in the data, although the data is limited. And I think that it all goes back to a lot of what these wonderful ladies have just discussed. And it goes back to the fact that the, so the social determinants and these social factors that are affecting the lives of these people are impacting them in, in such a way that their outcomes are being very um, disproportionately, disproportionately affected. And if we're not attentive to that and we're not looking at things like the barriers and accessibility and those other things that affect them, and things, especially for the black uh, population, like racism, like racism is a risk factor. And I think that's something that we're not exploring and something that we're not identifying. And I think that in addition to that, we're, we're all not understanding what a risk factor is, right? Mm -hmm. A risk factor is something that is modifiable, right? And it's modifi modified through counsel through a healthcare practitioner. But if we're not being attentive to the problem at hand and we're not trying to make an effort to make some type of change, then obviously the problems will consist. Um, I want to get into some numbers. You did mention that we don't have numbers and we will talk about why that is, mm -hmm. um, but you just said something that um, I just want to pick up on. You said that racism is a risk factor. Uh -huh. In what ways? So racism affects us in various ways, right? And I think that it goes back to the most basic level. If we look, and Ani kind of spoke to this earlier on, when we're looking at social determinants, like the black community is more likely, unfortunately, to be in a situation where they're experiencing poverty in addition to the indigenous community. We also know that they are, um, a lot of these women or people, families, are also experiencing higher levels of stress due to working conditions, due to various things. And then there's the microaggressions, right? Being within the healthcare system, there's that embedded racism actually within our system, um, within our healthcare system that affects the way that black people experience care, right? The implicit biases that you experience with your healthcare providers and these small things that affect the way that you even communicate, even with the receptionist, right? Mm -hmm. And how welcome you feel in that space. And feeling welcome and feeling like you have the ability, like I've spoken to various other midwives I know who are friends of mine, who have talked about moms not being able to come into appointments because they have three or four kids at home and they don't have the time or the opportunity to leave their child at home to go in to see a physician for prenatal care. And there are other studies that I've seen where um, nurses will actually go out and look for patients because they know those patients are high risk, they know that they're marginalized, just to bring, uh, pick them up and bring them in just so that they get that prenatal care. There are issues of transportation, issues of access accessibility at various levels, mm -hmm. right? And we're not being attentive to this. And then there are other issues that um, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada have identified around wait times, mm -hmm. right? We have no benchmark. We have no real, um, there's nothing that really signifies what wait times should look like in this space. And because of that, women are experiencing very adverse outcomes to another level. So the, the issues and the barriers are not in one space, right? They're connected to all these things. And racism is connected to your personal experience, which then leads to all of those. Uh, let's get into some numbers, that the numbers that we do have. And these are some numbers from a recent Statistics Canada report on infant health for Indigenous communities across Canada. These numbers for the Indigenous population include First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And this is per 1,000 live births. So preterm birth and non-Indigenous, you can see it's 0 0.67. Indigenous is 0 0.87. Still birth, 5.6. Indigenous higher, almost double at 9.0. Infant death, 4.4 for non-Indigenous. Mm -hmm. Again, almost double for Indigenous at 9.6. And for SIDS, uh, it's 0 0.3 for non-Indigenous. And uh, for Indigenous, it's 2.0. Uh, zero. And SIDS, it's Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, so, and Sarah, you've been involved in indigenous uh, perinatal health care as a midwife and researcher for 20 years. Uh, what's behind these numbers? Uh, well, I think it still goes back to a lot of these things that we're already talking about, the racism and discrimination and the differential access that um, that you know, indigenous families and and other racialized families are experiencing in uh, in the healthcare system, and it's like time to start thinking outside of the box. I mean, certainly, you know, those statistics they're very alarming, and this is uh, probably an undercount of even what the actual reality of what things are happening are. And 
I think all too often we look at these numbers and think, okay, well, that's um, something specific to Indigenous communities that live in remote or rural areas or the Arctic regions. Um, but the reality is that the majority of Indigenous people live in urbanized centres, and the health care outcomes are not improving when they move into these urban centres. So it is not simply just about kind of the, the physical access to infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It's actually something much, much deeper rooted, and I think it's the poverty and the racism and discrimination. But just to pick up on that, what does the role of geography play in accessing this kind of health care? Or even access to like a perinatal um, health care? Well, for, for northern regions, certainly geography is a challenge and it is an issue. But what I'm arguing is that the majority of Indigenous people don't live in those regions and the health care outcomes don't get better when they move into the urban centres. So and it's not so about it's not where about they geography. live. Right. It's not about where they live. It yeah. has to be something more upstream and much deeper rooted than, than simply just being able to go and see a family doctor because there are family doctors there or there is a hospital that's available. What if someone doesn't have Indian status and lives off reserve or identifies otherwise? Which is the majority of Indigenous people who live off reserve and in urban centres without non-insured health benefits, extended health benefits, um, extra supports that they have got in on, like on reserve and in First Nations communities. Uh, well, here's some numbers from a 2016 mm -hmm. study using long-form census data. And researchers found that in Canada, 8.9% of infants born to black parents were preterm, compared to 5.9% of white parents. In the United States, those rates were 12.7% and 8% respectively. Um, the study's takeaway was that the racial gap was similar in magnitude, even when you control for socio-demographic variables such as education and income. Um, how does this square our perception of what public health looks like in Canada, Onye? Well, I think, you know, public health takes pride in addressing um, social determinants of health. So those are the conditions in which we live mm -hmm. and trying to address those as best as possible. Um, for instance, you know, um, supporting uh, policies um, for, for lower income families and things that would help to uh, level the playing field for everyone in society. Mm -hmm. But I would say racism is the one that doesn't get enough attention. So you asked about how racism plays a role as a risk factor. And so when we're thinking about anti-black and anti-indigenous racism, it traces back to our history in Canada, right? And we, we ignore it. And, and even the United Nations has identified that in our institutions and in our systems here in Canada, uh, anti-black racism is pervasive and so is anti-indigenous racism. And so you look at our history of colonization, you look at our history of slavery and how our institutions have upheld um, perspectives in which uh, being white European puts you at an advantage across the board. So way before somebody has access to healthcare. And so this happens uh, in people's lives in mainly two different ways. So this is how racism plays a key. One is being denied opportunities, right? So where one is being denied opportunities, even when you're trying your best and you're doing everything society says you can do, that's stressful. And so that stress uh, affects people's hormone systems, it affects their immune system and makes them more likely to get sick in general, let alone when you're pregnant and you're more vulnerable. So uh, to give an example, uh, a study at McGill University from, uni excuse me, from McGill University showed that uh, based on census data from 1996 to 2006, a black person who had a university degree had similar um, unemployment rates to somebody who was non-black and had dropped out of high school. So basically, if you were white uh, in Montreal at that time and had dropped out of high school, your unemployment was about the same as a black person who had a university degree. That's stressful. So even if you're able to put food on the table, mm -hmm. that is a stressful condition that day in, day out, where you're denied opportunities because of your race, where you're the target of you know, the police system or the justice system because of your race, that adds stress. And it might not be you personally, but also happens at a community level. Mm -hmm. The second way is, of course, through being that denied that opportunity and that stress is further compounded when it leads to poverty. So as I mentioned before, indigenous people are more likely to live in poverty. Uh, black people are, are more likely to live in poverty as well as other racialized groups. So when you can't afford the food, you can't, as, as you mentioned, you can't make uh, your visits, you can't afford the medication, you're going to see worse outcomes. And so the numbers that you gave with regards to the indigenous population, the other thing people sometimes think is it's biological, it's genetic. Well, when you look at African-Americans in the United States, 
African-American babies born to African-American moms are twice as likely to mm -hmm. die within the first year of life. Mm -hmm. And as you said, you mentioned it yourself, that even when you um, take into account income and education, mm -hmm. there is that gap. Well, similarly, yeah. in Canada, we see that the indigenous population um, for, for babies who are born, they're twice as likely to die within the first year of life. They don't share a common mutation that is causing this. What they mm -hmm. share is a history of social deprivation and marginalization and racism. Is this what you would call systemic racism then? Absolutely. Um, we were talking about data, and even when we were putting this panel together, we had trouble getting data for different groups. Um, does the Ontario government collect race-based data when it comes to perinatal health care? No. no. No, they don't. No. And it's a more complex um, and why not? thing than just does the government simply collect data. I think even just identity just generally is, um, is something that's very complex for the Indigenous community. It was, um, you know, historically, uh, you know, not necessarily a good thing to be identified by the government as an Indigenous person because there were limitations that were put on you as an Indigenous person if you were uh, known to be a card-carrying status Indian person. And so those, the, the legacy of that piece has kind of filtered down where many families have removed themselves from that identity to the best uh, degree they possibly can. And it's only a new generation that are trying to reclaim those identities um, now that they're recognizing all the impacts it's had. What would the argument be for the province to start collecting uh, race-based data, Elsie? I, oh, I think specifically for the black community, it's important for us to understand what, why our outcomes are the way they are. And the only way that we can understand that is by collecting data and then conducting research specifically yeah. around that. If we don't have the data, we can't outline where the problem is coming from, or we can at least outline some type of, um, or provide us some type of understanding or foundation to help us to understand where these issues are coming from so that we know that it isn't biological, right? Like yeah. Dr. Norm said uh, just a moment ago. Yeah, and Sarah? Well, I think the important piece is that we need to be careful about who's collecting that data and then who's deciding who's holding the measuring stick because mm -hmm. when we know that when government is collecting the data, they're gonna, they're gonna frame the picture of how they share that data, you know, to be in their favor. And so I think we need to be careful about, you know, who's holding the measuring stick and then also what is being being shared and is it in the right context because you know, a particular outcome um, can be presented as it's simply something to do with access like people living in the remote north it might it must simply just be that they don't have the same access to hospitals that the outcomes are different but it's actually not that and so unless the actual community that is most impacted by the collection of that data mm -hmm. is involved in the um, analysis and context, and actually throughout the entire process of deciding how and who and where that data should get collected, then it's not actually going to be relevant or reliable. Um, I wanted to show you a clip from a TED. Uh, did you want to add something? Oh, no, I simply yeah. wanted to add that it's not just the collection of data, but it's how it's collected, who is collecting it, why it's being collected, and then finally, how you're going to find solutions, right? So data has been collected by, you know, with regards to the Indigenous population for, you know, very, you know, for generations, but no action was taken. So then it's not used for the purpose of improving outcomes. Mm -hmm. So now where populations or communities can be engaged, it can be used to not just uh, identify solutions, but find out what's working, right? The, the, um, the issue around race-based data, which by the way, was also flagged by the United Nations that we need to do mm -hmm. and give it, you know, the data by specific groups, not just say visible minority mm -hmm. or indigenous and non-indigenous, but drill down. Um, but where it is collected, then when we're having interventions and, and you know, we, we put our resources into something to find solutions, we want that data so that we can see, yes, we've had an impact, or no, we're not having an impact, we need to rethink what we're doing. So there's many reasons to collect it, but it needs to be co co um, collected mm -hmm. appropriately. Um, I want to show you a TED Talk that kind of touches on what we're talking about, and this is by Fatima Jackson-Best, a healthcare researcher based in Toronto. Um, Sheldon, please roll. Shortly after my mom had a six-year-old son, she started to say something wasn't right. She wasn't feeling normal, she was feeling a little off balance. So she went, she got diagnosed, and it turned out that my mom had postpartum depression. And it had a huge effect on our family uh, because it changed our family forever, but it also allowed us to come together as a family to support my mother. And so my mom went out and she started to look for different resources and different services that were specific to black women or to Caribbean women in Canada. And it's important to um, think about that because in Canada, which I'm sure a lot of you here have family and friends who live there, Canada is full of Caribbean people, full of Bayesians, full of Jamaicans, full of Trinidadians, full of, full of Caribbean people. And so she said to me, I can't find any research or any uh, services or any resources that's 
specific to my experience. Um, if you can't find those resources, how does that affect your experience during prenatal um, care? Elsie? I think uh, more specifically when we're looking at uh, prenatal care, we have to recognize that if you're, that's the most uh, important at part of this. It's the more important part of your journey during pregnancy. It's what kind of identifies whether or not you're going to have a great outcome or an outcome that's not that great. So if they're not receiving the care they need during that period or if they're not choosing not to use it or if they're mis misinformed, then obviously they're going to, I think we can identify that they're going to have detrimental outcomes at the end of this. And it goes back again to the barriers. And I just keep bringing this up because it is a problem that's consistent. I think that the lack of data and all these things also play a role. But if we are not actively finding solutions, if we're not actively trying to create programming or um, whatever it may be to support the needs of these particular populations, then we're wasting our time because the problem will continue to be perversive. It will continue to grow. And there will be no way to actually help these women. And I think that what's even more important is that, again, it goes back to numbers, like that we understand that this is a problem in Canada. I think that a lot of times, because there are no numbers, it's almost as if it's not as valid, right? And we have to look at the US for stats, and we have to look at other countries. And because of that, we don't pay as much attention to it in Canada as we should. Mm -hmm. um, but if we had those numbers, it would kind of allow us to truly be able to say, hey, this is the problem, and let's look at proper solutions. At least it would provide the government an opportunity to, to be held accountable for the issues that are be happening. And speaking of solutions, uh, later this year, you're launching an app called Mommy Monitor. Oh, yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> what, can you tell us about that? Yeah, no, it's so exciting. So Mommy Monitor was something that was developed after my master's uh, during, at McMaster University a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And the purpose is to be able to identify or to bring together technology and advocacy to help us to create an opportunity to analyze the behaviors of moms and help them to mitigate any potential risks that they could have that could lead to detrimental outcomes. And we do this by uh, asking them very basic questions that are based on the social determinants. And we analyze that data and then we identify what her potential risk may be. And then we connect her with a maternal mentor, which is a key piece in all of this, right? Mm -hmm. Data has shown consistently that maternal health care um, or maternal health care apps are more are 90 percent successful, but even more successful with face-to-face -face interaction. So what we did is looked at models from the global south, so places from the continent of Africa, because we know that they're effective there. And we brought those models here. And at the most basic level, just giving women um, much more monitoring, surveillance, because that's what the research says that we need, mm -hmm. culturally competent care, or culturally safe care, I should say, not competent. Um, but in addition to that, also social support. Because there are many women, especially our immigrant and refugee women, mm -hmm. they come into this country and they don't have the same social supports that they would have had back home. And that also plays a large role in how their outcomes are, or what their outcomes look like. So being able to provide them this patient navigator that has all these skills through a curriculum that we've kind of developed and supports them, not just as friends, but also as educated friends, then it gives them the opportunity to have that social support, but then also have a better pregnancy experience. And it's not just for the moms, it's for the families as well. We've got one more minute, and yeah. Sarah, I'll give it to yeah. you. Um, <laughs> what is the Baby Bundle Project? Uh, the Baby Bundle Project is um, a, it's a program that we designed uh, which, as a research project, but to uh, address some of our most vulnerable Indigenous families who are at, uh, really at increased risk of um, child protection involvement and apprehension of their babies at birth. And so we're trying to get more upstream to provide better wraparound supports um, and system integration so mm -hmm. that those families can get all of the supports that they need where they need them, mm -hmm. so not just at our office, but also out in the community um, and in different places where they're lack located and accessing other services and uh, getting us all to work together so we can start filling in the gaps instead of having lots of different spaces where they're duplicating services. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. well, we've got 30 seconds. I lied. Uh, I'll give you the last question, Dr. Noram. Um, how important is it to have culturally appropriate perinatal care for families, racialized families? It is incredibly important. I'm glad that you said families. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, earlier we were talking about um, or just issues of people being able to, their lifestyle and food. So just as simple as that, you know, we know that like um, women who are black, indigenous, South Asian are more likely to get diabetes when they're pregnant. Where you have a dietitian in your center who understands, uh, you know, the need for plantain, fufu, or whatever different kind of uh, food that people eat and how to tailor that. <laughs> yes. And how to tailor that for a diabetic diet, that has an impact. And then when, you know, after the baby is born and the whole family or the village or the community community comes mm -hmm. and they're the nurses and everybody and the physicians are receptive to that rather than being 
judgmental and rejecting that, that makes a difference. That improves the therapeutic relationship. And so we need more of that. And there are good models out there. And so we need to build on that. Well, thank you all for being here and helping us understand this issue better. Uh, we really appreciate you making time for the agenda. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.